Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Yuval Avin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. And it's my great pleasure to host this conversation with Jay Cost about his new book, James Madison, America's First Politician. Jay's our colleague here at AI. He's the Gerald R. Ford Non-Resident Senior Fellow. Uh, his work here is focused both on elections and public opinion on the one hand, and especially in recent years on political theory and political history in an effort to understand this complicated moment in American life. Jay's particularly interested in civic republicanism, which couldn't be more important right now as I see it. His prior books include The Price of Greatness, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and the Creation of American Oligarchy, and A Republic No More, Big Government and the Rise of Political Corruption. His essays and articles can be uh, found in a wide variety of venues, and he has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. This new book is an intellectual biography, uh, but it puts Madison's ideas in the context not only of James Madison's life, but of his career as a politician and of the emphasis he always put in his life on the importance of electoral politics and the, the life and work of the politician. He was, Jay says, maybe the most successful political actor, politician in the early republic. Um, it's a book that gives us a huge amount to talk about. Our format's gonna be very simple. Jay will tell us a little bit about the book for a bit, and then he and I will chat about it, and then we'll open it up to questions. If you're watching online, you can ask questions in two ways. You can email them to John Roach at ai.org, john.roach at ai.org, or you can tweet them at us with the hashtag AEIMadison, and feel free to send those questions throughout our conversation. We can gather them up and uh, ask them at the end. I also do wanna note that this event is part of a series of book conversations for us that we call the Edward and Helen Heinz Book Forums. We're enormously grateful to Edward and Helen Heinz, uh, great friends of AI, for supporting this kind of intellectual engagement around important new books. And with that, Jay Cost, please. Thank you, Yuval. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that very warm introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending virtually. Um, coming up on Thanksgiving, I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. So about my book, so you might be wondering, <clears throat> another James Madison biography. Um, you know, there, there seems to be a new Madison biography come out every couple of years. Noah Feldman just had one. Uh, I heard the other day that John Meacham is working on one. Um, uh, uh, Lynn Cheney wrote, I think, one of the best modern biographies of, of Madison. And, and of course, there's also Ralph, Ralph Ketchum's biography as well. Um, so there's lots of books on the facts of Madison's life and an interpretation of the facts of Madison's life and putting his life into a narrative that fits in our understanding of the early American period. But I wanted to do something different with this book. As you've all said, it is kind of an intellectual biography. Um, and what I was trying to do was trying to bridge a gap that I've noticed in my years of studying Madison, because I've been looking at Madison in one way or another for um, you know seven, eight years now, there are really you know very solid biographies that look at his life and the events of his life um, from the be his beginning in politics in 1776 through his you know last great political action opposing the nullification crisis. But then, and then there's this sort of a deep dive into his political theory, especially during the 1780s. So, uh, Federalist 10, Federalist 51. But I've noticed that the two are often differentiated. They're like two separate sets of, of books and investigations into Madison's life. There's Madison, the political theorist, and then there's Madison, the politician. And what I will try to do in this book is bring the two together and integrate the two and see Madison as almost the way we sort of understand Edmund Burke today, as a man of politics, not just, pol not just a politician or not just a political theorist, but, but sort of both. And there were two reasons that I thought this would be a good thing to do. The first is that there have been, and we can talk about this later, a number of supposed inconsistencies in Madison's political career that don't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, for instance, his opposition to the Bank of the United States in 1791, and then later on in 1815, he agrees to recharter it. Um, I think that a deeper investigation into his political philosophy can help us understand why he seems to change in mo his mind, and actually we can find you know, underlying, um, underlying consistencies that aren't necessarily on a policy level per se, but more on a 
philosophical level. And the other thing is if, if his political philosophy can help us understand his politics, I think his politics can help us understand his political philosophy. And that's where I think Madison ends up being very useful in the modern context. Um, and that gets to the subtitle of the book, America's First Politician. Now, I don't mean that literally that Madison was literally the first politician, although he certainly was one of the first in the sense that he was one of the first early professional practitioners of politics in the sense that many men of his age, like for instance, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, James Monroe, would have been politicians slash you know, plantation owners in the South, or you'd had people like Robert Morris in the North who were politicians slash merchants. There's really no slash for James Madison until, he, until the 19th century. His father, um, lived until the winter of 1801 and was in charge of Montpelier. Um, he, his father was in reasonably good health until the mid-1790s, so his fa it was his father's plantation. It was James Madison Sr.'s plantation, and it was a prosperous enough plantation that he could uh, afford for his son to go off and do politics. So Madison could commit himself full-time to politics in an age when the, the pay for such an endeavor was below subsistence level. So there's that. But there's also his political philosophy, I argue in the book, is really a theory of how politics can secure justice in the general welfare if it's a well-organized politics, a, a well-organized politics. This is the basic argument in Federalist 10, but when you look beyond Federalist 10 and look through the whole of his career with that idea, the vision you get from Madison is that politics is the venue by which reasonably satisfactory compromises can be discovered. The different factions and interests within society come into the political arena, particularly come into Congress, and they debate, they argue, they sometimes they argue, you know, with some tough words. Uh, you know, it's not always it's not like a forensic contest, right? It's actual politics. But in the process of politics, you can find something like justice in the general welfare. And I think, as well, that that idea was a model that he brings throughout the course of his entire political career. That Madison was a sort of hoping and trying to discover compromises. And so what you see through his career is an effort to blend the interests of whatever constituency he was representing, usually the, the fifth con congressional district of Virginia when he was in the House, uh, blending the interests of his constituents with the national interests and trying to find common ground among the factions within American society. And so his career is actually uh, 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 living out of Federalist 10 in many respects. And I think that this is what makes Madison such a useful person for us to study today. Because I think that Madison offers us a vision of politics that is fundamentally different than what we many of us take politics today. I would contrast Madison to Teddy Roosevelt before uh, his speech at the 1912 Republican Convention. You know, we stand at, Ar at Armageddon and we do battle for the Lord. You know, politics today is almost kind of like a holy war where there are, you know, there's the, there's the holy warriors and then the infidels. There's the wise and then the fools. There's the good guys and the bad guys and the effort, the, the goal, the, the, the ultimate purpose is to defeat our opponents, right? Take back the country is a common refrain. Madison would have us reject that and to see our political opponents as political opponents, but nothing more than political opponents. And he would encourage us, I think, to try to find common ground where common ground can be found and not presume that we can get rid of them because this is a diverse country. Uh, factions, there's always an election within, you know, within two years. One faction is down, another faction will soon be up. We ultimately have to live with each other and to do that we have to find compromise. And I think that if there's a lesson, something to walk away from in the, in James Madison's political career and his political philosophy, it's, it's that. It's, it's that politics, if it's practiced well and understood properly, can actually facilitate the national union and national harmony, which is very different than what we have today. So that's sort of my elevator pitch for the book.
Well, wonderful. It's a wonderful pitch and a wonderful book. And I do want to get at that question of the relevance to our moment of division and how Madison thought about a divided society. But maybe this being a biography, we can start at the beginning. James Madison, for those of us who study American history, appears kind of out of nowhere, fully formed. <laughs> uh, he was a very young man, all of a sudden becomes the leading constitutional thinker in the Republic. Where did he come from? Where, what what made this person who he was at that young age? And that, that is a good question. Um, I think one of, on a personal level, and if you understanding his personal qualities, I would say that the number one dominant characteristic of him is his work ethic. He had a, almost a superhuman capacity to work. As a matter of fact, one of the few surviving letters we have from his earliest days comes from one of his um, college friends, William Bradford from Pennsylvania, um, had heard that Madison was sick. And he says, I think you, you work too hard at Princeton because he went to Princeton. Um, and that really, I think, is one of the reasons why he's able to kind of quietly rise through the ranks. Because there were a lot of politicians who could talk a good game. And there are today as well. We, you know, we know who they are, people who talk a good game but don't put the legwork in. Patrick Henry was one of them, for instance, right? But Madison was really one to roll up his sleeves and dig into the policy details, which served him well in a couple ways. The first is it made him extremely useful. So he was um, brought into the Privy Council and for the governor, Patrick Henry, in 1777, and then he gets promoted into Congress, and he very quickly rises to a position of importance in Congress because Madison's simply willing to do the work. So that's one aspect. Another sort of unusual quality of Madison is that he is able to have a big picture view of political society, which we see in Federalist 10, but he's also able to take that vision and apply it to policy details. So it's not just that he was good at from a 30,000 feet perspective, but he was also very good at a granular level. And so by the time, you know, 1787, he's just 36 years old, he is remarkably uh, educated, not just in the grand theories of politics, like, you know, at that point, David Hume, Montesquieu, Locke, but also Madison knows in detail for the foreign policy situation. He knows in detail the military situation, the tax situation, um, and he's able to integrate all of these into a very impressive uh, political system almost. How did, how did this Virginian end up in Princeton? That is a good question. Well, there's a, a number of theories for that. Um, one of them was sort of the fear that, um, you know, most men of his, of his social status would have gone to the College of William and Mary. Um, Madison was very small. He was five foot four. He only weighed 100 pounds. He was sickly. Um, and there was a fear that going into the tidewater for long stretches would be bad for his health. And so there was an impulse to sort of put him uh, away from that. Another factor would have been his uh, tutor, Donald Robinson, was, uh, went to Princeton or the College of New Jersey. And also, the College of William and Mary, its reputation had really sunk since Jefferson had graduated. But on the other hand, uh, New Jersey was on the rise. And so the, all, which one of these factors ultimately had the lion's share? Is, we just don't have the evidence of it. But those are all probably factors. And what's your sense of what he learned there? How was his immersion in political theory and philosophy, his exposure to a different part of the colonial world, how did it help to make him who he was? Yeah, that's a good question. It was enormously important. Um, his, the uh, educator at Princeton or at the time was John Witherspoon, um, who was a Presbyterian minister. And so Madison being immersed in Presbyterianism was very significant because he was never an especially religious person, but his political philosophy, it certainly his view of human nature really kind of reflects a Calvinist worldview that is not something that within the traditional Anglican education would have been emphasized as much. The Anglicans were Calvinists, but the Presbyterians took their Calvinism very seriously and so did Witherspoon. So that would have been one factor. Another factor is that Witherspoon was Scottish and was very Whiggish in his 
in his uh, political ideas. So he disliked entrenched power, believed that institutions can and should be reformed. So Madison sort of inherited that as well. So that was another thing. And also, you know, being in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was at the time the the, the, the middle colonies were the most diverse colonies in the, in the United States or in the colonies at that point because the Quakers had encouraged religious toleration and immigration. Um, New Jersey was a multi-ethnic state, so also was New York, and you have all of these places right there. And so Madison being there gets a kind of almost a sort of instinctive kind of nationalism there. I mean, he writes a letter to his father, I think in 1770, at graduation, saying that the graduates had dressed in the American cloth, as he called it, that they actually saw themselves as Americans at that point. So that's another factor. I would say, though, that the Madison's education is unlike anything most of us have ever encountered. It would have been... Um, a truly immersive, comprehensive humanist education, the kind of which many universities used to try to offer but wouldn't offer as aggressively and now unfortunately don't even try. So it's not just, um, it's not just uh, you know, philosophy, political philosophy, but there's mathematics, there's history, there's, um, there's language, Madison leaves Princeton being able to speak and write Latin and Greek and um, French, which actually is a big factor in his rise because he can speak French. But also he stays to actually learn Hebrew, which might suggest that he had intended at some point to go under the ministry. We're not sure. Um, so it's just an incredible education. And it was one of those that a man like Madison, a young man like Madison, who was so uh, intensely committed to work, was able to really make the most of one of the great teachers of the 18th century, John Witherspoon. Mm. So we, we often meet him as the young delegate to the Constitutional Convention. How did he get there and who was he when he got there? Who would the other delegates have thought this young man was? Yeah, that's a good question. Madison would not have been a man like Washington or Franklin, a man of a continental reputation among all people. But people within the political community, within the national political community, would have known Madison. Um, and because he had distinguished himself in Congress as a man of integrity, a man of extreme hard work and extreme diligence and extreme attention to details. They would have known him to be very sober in his personal habits, not vindictive, generally, no, not generally, but trustworthy. Um, and they would have known him to be a nationalist and to have been a reformer. When he, he was in Congress, the Continental Congress from 1780 to 1783, and it's during this time that he falls into the orbit of the nationalists, which at that point are, is helmed by, um, by Robert Morris, the, uh, the merchant from Philadelphia. He tries within Congress to reform Congress from the inside, fails, he goes back home to Virginia in 1784 and does a couple of extraordinary things. Uh, one thing that he does is he forms an alliance with George Washington where he sort of functions as Washington's man inside the Virginia House of Delegates. And he also opposes Patrick Henry on the question of religious liberty and, and is the one to have enacted Jefferson's statute on religious freedom. So Madison by this point would have had a reputation as an accomplished politician as well. So among the delegates there, you know, he could, George Washington could walk down the street and people would turn and look. Ben Franklin could do likewise. People knew who these men were. Madison could be anonymous out in the world, but among the people in the room would have known Madison and have taken him very seriously. T tell us a little bit about that, that effort around religious toleration. Um, what brought it about? How did Madison become a force in it? And is that really where he first connects with Thomas Jefferson? Well, Madison's first connection with Jefferson occurs at the very end of his stint in the Privy Council. 
Uh, Patrick Henry's tenure as governor ends, Jefferson is put in place, and that is when the two begin to work together. Now, they had probably known each other as early as late 1776, although Jefferson would not have thought very much of Madison at that point. Um, and, and, you know, what's interesting about their relationship, especially in the early years, I mean, really through most of the 1780s, is it's done primarily through correspondence, uh, because Madison is in one place and Jefferson's in another, and so they develop a sort of lively correspondence that way. Madison's, um, so by 1784, Madison and Jefferson are already firm friends. And actually, they're firm enough friends that uh, Jefferson, uh, when they're talking, sort of complaining about Patrick Henry, uh, Jefferson actually writes to Madison that he, th he thinks that we should pray earnestly for his death, which is one of those funny sort of like, the, the, the founders often did not get along. So, um, and uh, so Madison, after his stint in Congress, goes into the House of Delegates, and Patrick Henry had actually been an ally of Madison's in the fight for religious liberty early on, but had come to think that the morals of, this, of the Commonwealth had declined, and so what was needed to do was a, an assessment, a tax, to support the the clergy, and to sort of get around the old preferences for like, you know, favoring one religion over another, Henry wants to levy a general assessment that would go to all, men, all Christian ministers. Um, and Madison opposes this he does a little bit of legislative ledger domain and, you know, one of those great, like I said, sort of in the weeds kind of, he gets, you know, the bill had to go through three readings before final vote. He, he gets a stall on the third reading before adjournment. He goes back to Montpelier and he writes this, really his first significant essay, The Memorial and Remonstrance um, Against Religious Assessments. And it's really one of the first instances where we see Madison's vision of how politics is supposed to function as a, as a neutral umpire, as that's a phrase he actually uses in correspondence with George Washington a few years later, that the job of the government is to secure justice for various factions within society. And that justice is not simply the domain of the courts, but every p question of politics is at least in part a question of justice. And the government should not be playing favorites. That's sort of the ethos, the underlying ethos that Madison had about um, religious sort of establishments. Also, Madison had been, um, you know, he had been raised nominal, nominally Anglican or Episcopalian, but the Episcopal Church did not have great um, roots within the Virginia Piedmont, and it had been corrupt and persecuted the Baptist, and who would have been Madison's neighbors in, in the Piedmont. So he had instinctively as a young man, and particularly the men of that age. So Madison would have been born in 1751, so he would have been a young man at the start of the revolution. And there was an ethos, a spirit of that age of sort of reforming and doing away with old, old sort of outdated modes of political operation. So he just would have instinctively been opposed to an established church. But Madison being Madison, takes that sort of instinct and sort of examines it and makes this really persuasive argument that even a general assessment is profoundly unfair. What, what's, what's his vision for what ought to come out of the Constitutional Convention when he enters it? Yeah, it's interesting because Madison's vision at the convention is for a hyper-nationalist government shockingly nationalist government by the standards of what we have today. His original proposal was for a government, a Congress, that could legislate in all cases where the national harmony was at stake or the states were deemed incompetent, which would, for all intents and purposes, be a plenary power. He also wanted to give the, state, the Congress a veto over state laws, similar to the prerogative that the British sovereign had over mm -hmm. the colonies. So this is a pretty big ask. Madison also wants to have a Congress that is completely proportional in its representation. So it's all very interesting because, you know, a lot of times I see critics of the Constitution criticize James Madison for all of these things that it doesn't do, that, that you the, know... The Senate lot, that he hated so yeah, much. Yeah, the Senate that he hated so much, the enumeration of powers. The, he actually was very nationalistic, and that had been born of hard experience where he had come to the conclusion that the state governments had been the bad actors in the country since the revolution had been declared, and 
and that it was only the people of the United States of America in all of their diversity that could govern responsibly. So what he wanted to do is having placed his trust in the American people, he wanted to establish them as the supreme sovereign as opposed to the federal system that we have today. That was his initial request. And yet when that turns out not to be everybody's will at the convention, Madison becomes a deal maker. He does. He does. It's interesting because there's a great historical irony that um, you know Federalist Ten is his great sort of statement of defense of national republicanism. But while he was finalizing that draft, he was writing a letter to Thomas Jefferson, basically denouncing the Constitution, basically saying this is not going to work. Um, the the idea of a federal system where the states and the federal government both retain sovereignty, he, he, an imperio in imperium, he said, was a solecism. It was a contradiction in terms. And actually, Federalist 10 is really more of a defense of the Virginia plan than it is the Constitution itself. He had actually sort of worked through the basic ideas of Federalist 10 before he got to Philadelphia. And he did, at various points in the convention, he made those arguments. He repurposed it. But what we see, though, is this very interesting development in Madison is that after the rise of the Anti-Federalists during – the Anti-Federalists are an interesting group in and of themselves and worthy of study and serious consideration as, as, as interesting political philosophers with a competing vision that in many respects has been proven correct, I think. But the Anti-Federalists begin to emerge in the fall of 1787. And what's interesting about them is that they agree with Madison in the sense that an imperio in imperium is a contradiction in terms and that this government is not going to be able to sustain in a sort of dual kind of sovereignty. But whereas Madison believed that ultimately the states would swallow up the federal government, they believed that the federal government would swallow up the states. And so this is what makes Madison such an effective polemicist in the Federalist Papers because he didn't think that the anti Federalists were merely wrong. He thought that they were exactly wrong. And what's interesting during the period of the debates over ratification, Madison makes his peace with the Constitution and comes to recognize that this is the best that can be practically attained and that in the grand scheme of things, it's actually pretty good. And what helps him along the way, I think, and I don't think he's wrong about this either, is that a lot of the anti-federalists, not so much the anon anonymous polemicists, but a lot of the leaders like Patrick Henry, I think, Madison judged, and again, I don't think he was incorrect about this, that they were trying to kill the Constitution without actually having to be the trigger man. So P Henry opposed the Constitution root and branch and had but was unwilling to just come out and say we should reject it outright. Instead, he said, we need to have a conditional ratification or we need to have a second convention or it was one of these things where they, the anti-federalist leaders seemed to recognize that they had miscalculated by staying away from Philadelphia, so they wanted a second chance, but they weren't being honest about it. And I think this is also something that pushes Madison into a very vigorous sort of defense of the Constitution. In the place where he thought they were exactly wrong, weren't they right? The, 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 the dif if the difference between them is which level of government will overwhelm which, wasn't Madison wrong to expect that the states would be too powerful for the federal government? Yes, I think he was. I think this was one of his miscalculations um, at the time. But also, I think it's important to bear in mind um, that he was wrong over the course of however many generations. And I think in that regard, the kind of moderate federalism of John Marshall on the Supreme Court really sort of filling in the blanks of what the Constitution had left um, ends up being of of remarkable importance in that in that respect, but yeah, I, I and I you know I, I also think it depends on how you look at it, and I think it also depends on where you look too. I mean, if you scan ahead to a hundred years to eighteen eighty seven, you would say, well, the Senate is corrupting the republic and the senate is the tool of the northern political machines in the states and the segregationist states in the south and that this has thwarted the national government. So I think it probably depends on where you look. I think certainly 
from today in the 21st century, Madison was wrong. But I also think that that comes after, I think really Franklin Roosevelt kind of inverts the constitutional structure in many respects. But I do think he was right to understand that there was always going to be a tension there. Maybe um, he was, I think both sides tended to view it kind of a little too mathematically, that it was a contradiction and that like all mathematical contradictions, it will resolve itself. But this is not mathematics. This is life. And we live with tensions all the time. So Madison walks away from the convention, a great defender of what comes out of it and launches into a defense of it in the state ratifying conventions through the Federalist. How did the Federalist happen? How did he and the Hamilton come together in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. The context of the Federalist is really Madison being stationed in New York uh, after the convention ends because he's back in the Continental Congress. So he's in New York and the Continental Congress is not really doing much of anything at this point. And he's in New York with Hamilton, um, which is an important situation for a couple of reasons. For starters, he's in the middle of the country, so he's able to receive intelligence from all parts of the country and then pass it along to other parts. And you also see, particularly in New York, you see a flurry of anti-federal publications, the most significant of which was certainly Brutus. Um, and I think both he and Hamilton were thrown by this. And I think, like I said, Madison was especially thrown because he thought Brutus was exactly wrong. And so I believe that the idea to write the Federalist Papers was uh, Hamilton's idea. And of course, Hamilton writes the great bulk of them. The, the Madison we find in the Federalist, and maybe especially in those that we especially identify with him, Federalist 10, 51, um, is trying to think about political balance in a sense. How do you resolve the problem, the difficulties that what we would think of as a liberal society might always confront the dangers of falling into tyranny in one direction or another. And he sees the Constitution almost as a kind of machine mm -hmm. that might sustain the balance. But there are these moments in The Federalist where Madison makes an argument about the necessity of a certain kind of citizen, a certain kind of civic spirit, how central was that piece of the story to Madison's understanding of American politics? Or how much is he really a kind of mechanistic, people say Machiavellian I, political thinker? I think that it is more important than the Federalists would make it seem. I, I think that a lot of times when you look at the Federalists, there is not much of a mention of virtue. But the question is why? Is it because Madison assumed or Madison didn't think that virtue was necessary, or did he just assume that the American people had a sufficient stock of virtue that this wasn't actually something worth debating? I think it's the latter, um, and I think for a couple of reasons. If you look at his essays in opposition to Alexander Hamilton, where he sees the republic under threat, he is calling upon the American people in their virtue, in their small r republicanism, to vindicate the national interests. Um, another place you see this is later on in, in what his probably his most under, misunderstood um, uh, public uh, essay is the Virginia uh, the the, uh, the Virginia resolutions. Mm -hmm. You know the Virginia resolutions have been wrapped up in in sort of uh, uh, Jefferson's Kentucky resolutions, where Jefferson wants to give uh, Kentucky the power to nullify the laws of the federal government, nullify the sedition. That's not what Madison wants to do. Madison instead emphasizes the, what he calls interposition, which is harkens back to a Hamiltonian notion, ironically, where if the federal government, Hamilton argues this in the, in, in the Federalist Papers, that if the federal government's misbehaving, the states will sound the alarm. So Madison is trying to sound the alarm through the, through the Virginia House of Delegates to the other states, which again implies that there is a certain level of virtue that exists within the American people. And I think it's important um, to bear in mind the context in which Madison is writing. This is 1787. The, the memory of the revolution and is still fresh. The generation that fought the revolution is still alive. So this is not a period where you would... Um, this is not one of those moments 
where you would be seeing a kind of decay in virtue per se. That or and and so it's not something that Madison, I think, in 1787 really needs to call for a revival of. So the Constitution is ratified. Madison decides that his place is in the House of Representatives. Why is that where he wants to be? This is someone who could have been at least in the Senate, who could have been in, in the president's cabinet, it seems like he didn't want to. Well, you can thank Patrick Henry for his lack of placement in the Senate. Um, Henry was not the dominant figure in the Virginia ratifying convention, which actually speaks to Madison's political acumen, because Madison and, and, the, and you know, the other delegates did not send the Constitution to the state legislatures. They sent it to special ratifying conventions. And this was a way to get it out of Patrick Henry's hands because Henry was the master of the House of Delegates. And so Henry um, appoints uh, Richard Henry Lee, and I don't remember who the other fellow is. Henry himself refuses to take a Senate seat because he cannot in good conscience take the oath of office to uphold the Constitution. Um, and Henry tries as well to keep keep Madison out of the house um, be through basically, you know, what we today call a gerrymander. He's very lucky he it doesn't, doesn't get the nickname Henry Mander because he designs Virginia's 5th Congressional District, basically stacks it with anti-federalists, and if that's not enough, talks James Monroe, his friend, Madison's friend, into running. Madison beats Monroe 57% to 43%, so he's in the House. But, you know, another thing to bear in mind in terms of a cabinet position probably would not have happened um, because, for starters, if there was going to be, if you look at Washington's cabinet, you see uh, Henry Knox, who's from um, Massachusetts. You see um, Alexander Hamilton, who is from New York. And then, so there's presumably going to be a Southerner. That was going to always be Thomas Jefferson. So, and I think that is, you know, an interesting thing that historians, I think, have made too much of as Madison being Jefferson's junior. He was his own man. He had his own ideas, and he was free to z disagree with Jefferson, um, and he did very often. But he also, at the same time, Jefferson was the senior partner. And that mattered a lot in Virginia politics. The notion of line jumping was not considered something that was appropriate. James Monroe actually tries to jump over Madison in 1808 for the presidential election. And it opens up a breach in their friendship that isn't closed for like another two years. Mm. So even if it might be too much to say that Madison is the father of the Constitution, he's surely the father of the Bill of Rights, but in a strange way, yes. right? He was, he, he was against the Bill of Rights and argued against it at the convention and after. And yet when he's in Congress, he not only is intent on keeping the promise, he seems to be a champion genuinely of the Bill of Rights. Yeah. You, you say in the book that oh, these contradictions will all be worked out if you understand James Madison as a politician. Right. So help us understand sure. how he changed his mind about the Bill of Rights. Uh, yeah, so he almost is sort of, um, it, those uh, in our audience of a certain age will remember the, the 2004 John Kerry flip-flopper. He was like a flip-flopper on the Bill of Rights. Um, it's an interesting, and I think that the, the mistake, it was a legitimate mistake they made in Philadelphia not to include a Bill of Rights. Um, it alienated George Mason. It was easily the best argument that the anti-federalists had against the Constitution. Um, so it was probably correcting something that was a mistake. Madison's opposition to the Bill of Rights was really not very serious or substantive. For, for starters, the question was, how are we going to go about doing amendments to the Constitution? Are we going to withhold our state's ratification until we get amendments? That was something that he was opposed to, sort of like a conditional ratification, which is one of those ways that the anti-federalists were trying to kill the Constitution without actually being caught. Uh, the other way was what was developed in Massachusetts was recommendatory amendments. So this was the idea that... Um, uh, Massachusetts uh, ratifies the Constitution without condition and then submits a series of amendments in good faith uh, to Congress for its consideration. 
Virginia does the same, New York, New Hampshire, South Carolina, North Carolina, they all do the same. So this is part of how the Constitution is ratified in the end, the idea of recommendatory amendments. So that is an important factor for Madison, is that the ratification of the Constitution was premised on the good faith assumption of skeptics, right, skeptics of the Constitution, that their needs and concerns would be addressed. And so Madison, in an effort to cultivate that kind of national unity, ends up embracing a Bill of Rights when he's in Congress. The other advantage is, well, I would say another thing is that Madison did not think that a Bill of Rights would do much good. Because, of course, it's before judicial review. So the question was, you know, how are these rights going to be enforced? And Madison's view was that, frankly, if the people want to trample on an unpopular speech, unpopular speech will be trampled upon. So he did not believe in parchment barriers. But he also doesn't think parchment barriers will do a lot of harm. He also thought that if it was well written, it could cultivate a love of liberty and within the people, which is another thing. And, you know, another concern that he had was that if we begin enumerating our rights, the government in future generations will get the false impression that these are all the rights we have. So this is why we get the Ninth Amendment. So Madison's opposition to the Bill of Rights is sort of a soft opposition. And when he gets into Congress, you know, ultimately it's an act of good faith. Um, is that the expectation among many of the moderate sort of the people on the fence backed the Constitution expecting some set of amendments. And a lot of members of Congress didn't want to do it because it was dominated by Federalists, pro-Constitution people. So Madison actually has to be the one to push them to adopt the Bill of Rights. Not Like, again, not because he particularly believes it's necessary, but it's, it's necessary to get widespread public buy-in to the new government. You said at the outset that he valued compromise, a politics of accommodation, but we also think of Madison as a father of the party system. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, this may be in some ways the most interesting, illuminating piece of the book for me. You, you're, you argue that he's not actually a father of the party system as we think of parties. That the what he had in mind to do and what he and Jefferson were up to was actually something very different from what ultimately created the party system. That's right. I think that the real father of the pardon, modern party system would probably be Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren seeing parties as a permanent feature of American governance. Mm -hmm. Madison and Jefferson don't see that. Um, and it's one of the unfortunate things is that we collectively today have misremembered the name of their party. Yeah. So it makes it difficult for us to appreciate what they're actually up to. Uh, I'm not sure where the phrase Democratic Republican came about, but it did not it's, come it's from... It's probably a 20th century yeah, thing, isn't it? I, I, I'm not sure, so I'm, I'm speaking out of hand here a little bit, but I've long suspected that it was an invention of the New Deal historians mm -hmm. to sort of, um, Jeff, uh, Roosevelt Jeff. was very intent on capturing the, the, the mantle of Jefferson. Uh, that's mm -hmm. just a theory, I'm not sure, I haven't investigated that. It's just my hunch. Um, that's not what they called themselves. They called themselves the Republican Party. And that name is an important name. They chose that name purposefully. It's actually, for us today, you think the Republican Party, you think the GOP. So it, the word Republican in today's ears is fraught with, you know, political opposition. But their view was that they were representing the Republican interest. In other words, the people of the United States of America who embraced their particular vision of self-government, that where the people would ultimately be sovereign rather than a handful of elites, which is how they perceived the fight with Hamilton. And the fight with Hamilton is, I mean, for starters, it's really... It's a fight with Hamilton and his allies. It's really a fight against the high Federalists, as they came to be called. Because once the Republicans, once Jefferson wins the presidency, they work very aggressively to win over the moderate Federalists, right? So it's really a, a fight against the high Federalists. And, and I would not even put John Adams in the category of high Federalists as well. I think the fact that, I mean, Madison was never a fan, but the fact that Jefferson and Adams reconcile and have this warm friendship over the years is a testimony to the fact that the high Federalists are a particular 
uh, faction in government and sort of centered around the personality of Hamilton and a particular belief in in the the uh, a unique role for political elites, uh, natural aristocracy, which they all agreed existed, but Hamilton, Madison and Jefferson thought, and I don't think they were wrong about this, were looking to ensconce themselves permanently within the government, independent in many respects of the people themselves, which is not a view that most Federalists would have had or not a view that all Federalists would have had. Um, and so that's what they're opposing that particular vision of Hamiltonian high federalism, which they thought, and they were wrong about this, but they're, they're, it's understandable, their view, but they thought that Hamilton was trying to push the United States into a monarchy. And the reason they thought that in a lot of respects was because Hamilton was pursuing a lot of the tools or was utilizing a lot of the tools and employing a lot of the same policies that the British Prime Minister would pursue on behalf of the King, off in what Madison and Jefferson and the sort of the country Whigs of Bolingbroke and the Cato's letters would thought ran contrary to the interests of the people. Through his economic plans, through his through his economic plan. I mean, for I, the best phrase I would I would say, the best way to understand it is that Hamilton. Was, ter was utilizing, or maybe the better way to put it would be, he was allowing his financial system to be used as a kind of political patronage, is what he was doing. And so Jefferson and Madison really thought their party was a temporary measure. And yes. in fact, they thought it had been a temporary measure after, they, after they, the, the beginning of the era of good feelings. Yes, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and um, it's actually Van Buren uh, who is the one who has a problem with this. He, he is against the, um, the kind of policies that Monroe is pursuing that are sort of tamping down on party divisions. Mm -hmm. Madison himself is not a very aggressive party man during his administration. Jefferson, I, I don't think Jefferson gets enough credit um, for his domestic policies in, I mean, oftentimes when we think about Jefferson, we think about the trouble with Britain and the disaster of the Embargo Act, all of which are fair criticism of him. But it's remarkable that the Republicans did not go measure for measure against the Federalists, which is something that I think we would never, I think is completely alien to our politics today. That like, if, if one of our political parties were to enact something like the Sedition Act, uh, I think the other party, as soon as they get in control, would use the Sedition Act against the first party, and they would justify it on the basis of, well, you start, I mean, we see this all the time. Both parties today like are reducing the sort of like, or, or like a race to the bottom with every, di every step downward is justified by the opposition step downward. And by 1799, the country had reached a level of paranoia and partisan backbiting. And it's really remarkable that Jefferson hits the pause button on that, I think. And, and and the and I you know I don't really get into this in the book, but it is remarkable that at the end of Madison's tenure, and I think too much of our understanding of Madison's presidency has been dictated by Henry Adams's by Henry Adams's work from the late uh, 19th century. But you know when Madison left office, he was almost universally celebrated and inaugurated what was, I mean, it's been overstated, but the era of good feelings was a real thing. It didn't last that long, but my goodness, can you, so I'm 43 years old. I, so I've been an adult since 1997. There has not been a two year period in my adult lifetime that we could say, oh yes, that was the era of good political feelings, right? So I think it's a credit to them in many respects, to, to Jefferson and to Madison as well. Well, so save Madison's reputation as president. I, 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 I think that it's easy to look at his career and say, Madison was a natural legislator. He was born for the Congress. He was not well suited to executive power. And he thrived as a member of Congress and in the convention even functioned as a legislator, making deals, reaching compromises. But when it came time to be president, it wasn't his thing. He had a, several problems with the presidency. Um, I think that on balance, his presidency was actually pretty good. I think that his real failure was the Secretary of State. 
um, in sort of leading, encouraging Jefferson to turn the embargo into a form of commercial warfare, which ends up ensnaring. He's basically hoisted by his own petard, as they say, right? By the time he becomes president, this is a disaster. And he has to spend six of his eight years as president extracting himself from that. But you're right, Madison did not have a natural talent for the executive. And a lot of that had to do with his view, his vision of the executive. He was not, it was really Jackson who brings to the presidency this idea of the executive as the tribune of the nation. Madison sees Congress as being the national spokesperson. And frankly, he is too deferential to the Congresses that he gets because he doesn't really have good Congresses is one of his problems. And, and he allows Congress to push him around. It f embarrasses Albert Gallatin, forces him to take a third rate um, as Secretary of State, uh, Robert Smith. And Madison is sort of reminiscent of Jimmy Carter, sort of a micromanager. You know, Madison wants Gallatin as Secretary of State. There's this faction in Congress that won't have him, so Madison takes Robert Smith, who is Samuel Smith, the senator from Maryland, his brother, and Madison just decides to be his own Secretary of State. This is too much work for any one person. So there are a lot of problems with him as president. But I also think that the office, as an office, had not yet taken on the vision that we today see of actually, ironically, it was Hamilton who was right about the notion of vigor in the executive, right? And this is something that Madison, you know, it's not a coincidence that Madison didn't use that phrase. And mm -hmm. I think, especially Madison being a wartime president, the absence of vigor was particularly noteworthy in his administration. Was there a disagreement between them about the purpose of government? What did Hamilton think the, the national government was supposed to achieve, and what did Madison think it was meant? I like to analogize Hamilton's vision of government as a head coach or a manager of a baseball team. If Madison sees the government as an umpire, being neutral between factions, Hamilton sees it as the manager of the factions and sort of like putting them in the best position for the sake of the whole team. So Hamilton is not opposed to playing favorites, which is what he does, and that's really the source of their disagreements in the 1790s. Hamilton, and he had good reasons for this that have been vindicated by history, Hamilton had good economic reasons reasons for favoring the owners of liquid capital, right? The problem, though, was that that was a relatively small minority in the country. But Hamilton believed, and not wrong, that owners of liquid capital were going to place a bet on the success of the government, and the government needed to make sure they were betting that it would succeed, and Hamilton was going to privilege them. But that's the sort of thing that Madison had long, for the entirety of his career, had been so opposed to. So help us think about this narrative of contradictions. You mentioned it uh, at the beginning, this, the notion that Madison changed his mind or contradicted himself on some really key questions between the time of the, of the Constitutional Convention and, say, the end of his presidency. The, 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 the disagreement he had with Hamilton um, earlier than that, when he was still in Congress, was that a... Was that a a contradiction on behalf of Thomas Jefferson? Was he arguing with his own past self? Did Hamilton change? What happened there? No. Well, start for starters, that is a common belief that Jefferson returns from France and Madison changes. It's, it's not true. Um, I mean, the timeline doesn't match up. Jefferson returns from France in September 1789, and he tarries in Monticello. Oh, I should retire. I don't know if I want. And he doesn't get into really situated in the government until 1790. Madison is already in the trenches with his sleeves rolled up, fighting Hamilton's political agenda in the summer, in the, excuse me, in February 1790. Um, and with respect to the idea of a national bank, Madison had been a skeptic of that when Robert Morris had proposed it during uh, 1783, I want to say, maybe 81 or 82. So Madison had long been a skeptic of banks. Now, ultimately, Madison's objections to Hamilton's system was its one-sidedness. It's really difficult, I think, to appreciate now how much so the, all of the major proposals 
of Hamilton's system benefited in the first instance a very narrow class of very relatively wealthy people. But importantly, all of those benefits compounded upon one another to sort of give them what would we would today call windfall profits. And that was something that Madison was so fundamentally opposed to. And as a matter of fact, at least with respect to the assumption of the state debts, which was the main point of contention in 1790, mm -hmm. modest adjustments to the timeline over the assumption of the state debts could have won Madison over, right? Now, with respect to the Bank of the United States, Madison was likewise opposed to the Bank of the United States. Um, but again, a lot of that had to do with the way the bank was set up. So when the bank gets rechartered in 1815, a lot of the initial things that Madison thought should happen actually end up do happening. And there's another change as well. The Bank of the United States in 1787 was just going to be stationed basically in New York City. But by 1815, you have a country that has gone all the way west to the Mississippi River. And it's ironic because it is New England and the Mid-Atlantic that have good state banking systems, but it's the South and the West that are lacking them. And one of Madison and, Jeff Madison and Gallatin's emphases with the second bank, and even with the first bank, was to begin spreading bank branches out through the country. So even then on an issue like the bank, the devil is in the details, so to speak. The second bank serves many of the similar functions that the first bank does, but it's organized in a way that is much more harmonious with Madison's politics in its distributing benefits far and wide. Such that when, you know, we usually think of like when Andrew Jackson uh, vetoes the bank in 1832 that he's standing up for the South and the West. That's not what he's doing. It's the Southern and Western congressmen were the biggest proponents of rechartering chartering the bank. It was actually the New York faction of the Democratic Party that wanted to kill the bank because they wanted the financial power to migrate from Philadelphia to New York. So the second bank ends up being really an agent of kind of Jeffersonian development. Hmm. And what do you make of Madison's own argument about why he changed his mind on the bank? This oh, it's, that it's a disaster. The, Constitution, the meaning of the Constitution changes in practice, and, yeah. it's, it's, and you have to follow those kinds of changes. You can't... Uh, the, the idea of the kind of liquidation of the meaning yeah. of the terms. Yeah, it, that's the... His constitutional hermeneutic is a complete disaster. It, it, it is the one... And it's very ironic, because he's known as the father of the Constitution. Uh, but his explanations for his legal justifications do not make any sense. Um, he doesn't even follow them himself. I mean, a good example of that is his veto of the bonus bill, which is one of the last things he does as president of the United States. The bonus bill was a bill that was passed to take the bonus from the bank and use it as a fund for internal improvements. Madison vetoes that, says there's not sufficient precedent for the government funding eternal improvements, except Jefferson funds the Cumberland Road. <laughs> Right When the state of Ohio is chartered, Jefferson creates a fund to build the Cumberland Road. And then Madison, as president, actually expands the Cumberland Road. So in, in what sense, and Madison's argument was that the bank is now constitutional because it has 20 years of precedent and all the disagreements about it had, have died down, which wasn't true, by the way. There was still a solid anti-bank faction, and they're going to have their day you know, 15 years later with the second bank. But, you know, if that's the case, like, let's assume that's the case for the bank. Why is it not also the case for internal improvements? And John Quincy Adams, you know, eight years later as president, basically makes the point that Madison refuses to make, right? That if precedent is, if precedent is sanctioning the bank, then it must also sanction internal improvements. Matt, the fact that Madison is unwilling to do that is, I, and, and I think that the ultimately the problem is, is that there's, the argument that I make in the book is the problem with Madison's theory is that there's a there's an implied statute of limitation for constitutional theft, right? That Hamilton had violated the Constitution 20 years ago, but the statute of limitations has passed, and so therefore it's legal. So what that suggests then is that you know, we have a government of limited powers unless somebody can snatch the powers, some political agent can snatch the powers, doesn't get caught on it for a sufficient amount of time. I mean, it's, it, like I said, Madison himself is unwilling to embrace that and because I, I think the bonus bill, the veto, is really a rear guard, final kind of intellectually inconsistent 
maneuver meant to remind the country that the Constitution doesn't grant plenary power, when really what he should have done, if he was being intellectually consistent on this, would have been to embrace a constitutional amendment, but that was inconvenient. So it is, I think that is the one area of his political life, the meaning of these vague phrases within the Constitution. He had, um, if he didn't like something, he could often find constitutional reasons to oppose it. And if he liked something, he could find constitutional reasons to support it. So more consistently, how would these vague phrases be given meaning? By the courts? No, not in Madison's view. I mean, ironically, it's ironic because... Um, you know, in uh, McCullough v. Maryland, Marshall saves the bank. And Madison is just angry about it. Like, Madison is yeah. mad that Mar Marshall is injecting um, a particular vision of the Constitution uh, into his rulings. And, and I, I think that, you know, ultimately this was a, a I don't want to say a failure, maybe a better word is an oversight, is there was no, at the Constitutional Convention, there was no mechanism for resolving disputes over the meaning of the Constitution. Federalist 51 posits that politics can solve this, and I think it does to many respects, but it creates this kind of vague kind of area that the courts just kind of jump in. And I would say to Madison's credit, in his original Virginia plan, he had wanted what New York State had, what was a, called a Council of Revision, where the president in Madison's system, the president and several senior judges of the courts would evaluate congressional laws for their constitutionality. And then, but Congress would have the ultimate authority to override the Council of Revision. That would have been a way to resolve constitutional disputes, um, but that wasn't included. They instead settled on the Supremacy Clause. There's this sort of gap in the Constitution that Marshall then bridges um, in Marbury versus Madison. So we have just a few minutes, and I want to draw in some questions that have come from people who are watching. And maybe to begin with, it, it's hard to think about Madison without thinking of the War of 1812. How should we think about the War of 1812? Um, I like the War of 1812. I think it's funny. Um, I think the funniest part of the, and we, I think we can all appreciate how funny the War of 1812 is because every time we go to a baseball game, we sing the Star Spangled Banner. And the, the lyrics to the Star Spangled Banner are actually very funny because we are celebrating in that song, we are not celebrating a victory. We are celebrating the fact that the British did not get a victory. We're celebrating the lack of a defeat, right? Is that Francis Scott Key was on that boat, worried that Fort McHenry would fall, and Fort McHenry doesn't fall. And there's this, it, and that was the attitude coming out of that war, that we had stood up to the British and we didn't lose. And it's a, a remarkable war because in 1812, in 1813, and 1814, the United States executes this plan to invade Canada and they're gonna start in the Niagara Peninsula and they're gonna finally work their way up to Quebec. And in three campaign seasons, they don't get with the outside of eyesight of the Niagara River. It is a complete disaster. And it's only these sort of three remarkable victories at Plattsburgh and at Baltimore and then finally at New Orleans uh, that the Americans uh, rebut the British invasion. And they, but they walk away with this enormous sense of national pride. But I, I think, though, that there is a bigger, more important, more fundamental lesson to the War of 1812, and that I think Madison des deserves a lot of credit for this, is that the Republican rhetoric from people like Henry Clay and James Monroe, it was all very, you know, USA, USA after the war. Like, but there's, there was an implicit recognition that the government was not doing what was necessary to secure the national interest, both at home and abroad. And so this is where you see the Bank of the United States. This is where you see protective tariffs are implemented for the first time. Uh, this is also where you see a more aggressive push for internal improvements. All of this forms at the end of Madison's first term, and it ends up becoming basically the foundation of America's political economy until the Great Depression. Madison, in many respects, is responsible for that. But I think on a military level, you see after the War of 1812, you see an investment in a permanent military establishment, right? So permanent quartermaster, you see a, Jefferson had created West Point, but there's more of an investment in West Point. And so this pays off 
and the Mexican-American War, right? The realization after the War of 1812 was that the militia was insufficient to defend the national interests, and we, and the military was also just a disaster, so we need to invest in the military. So that pays off in the, in the Mexican-American War, and that in turn, pays off during the uh, Civil War. I, it, it, without the sort of existing military establishment that the national government could call upon, I'm not sure that Lincoln would have had the, the necessary bureaucratic, or whatever you want to call it, fundamentals to hold, hold, to force the South to surrender ultimately at Appomattox. So mm -hmm. there are long range consequences to the War of 1812, most of which I think are benevolent. So you, you, you mentioned the Civil War. Madison, toward the end of his life, begins to sense the coming shadow of nullification and deeper problems. And he rediscovers his nationalism. He's very involved at the end of the day in the debates over nullification. What drew him in? What did he th see coming? What did he have to say? Yeah, well, so Madison lives until 1836. So he lives long. He is the last of the founders. He lives, also lives longer than Monroe. Um, you might argue that he lives too long because he does see the specter of disunion. And Madison is particularly concerned about Calhoun's heresy, really is what it is, um, in large part because the two states that were most inclined to be drawn into that vision of things were Virginia and South Carolina, both of which had been hit very hard by the Panic of 1819. Um, and Virginia's old tobacco economy is basically falling into a shambles. Uh, you know, Montpelier is going to be foreclosed on, Monticello likewise. You know, a lot of those Piedmont planters had moved from growing crops to actually breeding slaves, horrible, horrible developments. Um, and so really those two states more than the rest of the original 13 are kind of becoming a land apart. And this is why Calhoun's arguments are so appealing. And Madison, still living in the Piedmont, sees the lure of Calhoun's argument with his neighbors. And so that is, I think, one of the main things that draws him in. You know, another aspect that draws him in, in, in is that they were frankly relying on his old arguments. Um, Calhoun had um, a constitutional argument and he could pick and choose quotations from the Federalist and from the, you know, he had his best historical analog in the Kentucky resolutions, but also relying on the Virginia resolutions. And unfortunately for Calhoun, um, Madison is still alive and he is I mean, he's very old at this point. Uh, he's, you know, increasingly crippled by rheumatoid arthritis, but he is still James Madison. Um, and so he's just not going to let it stand. The, this is a question from a viewer, too. At, at the end of his life, were there things Madison regretted, reassessed, thought about differently looking at his own career? Do we have any evidence of that? Uh, it's hard to say. I would say Madison was never really one to admit his mistakes. I would say. Um, I mean, not that anybody really is, um, but Madison, I think like a lot of really brilliant men, had a hard time appreciating the limits to his own brilliance. So I don't, for instance, you know, his, he, he takes Hamilton's economic ideas at the end of his presidency and repurposes them into a political system that's more consistent with his ideas. It, he never went back, at least as far as I know, never thought Hamilton had a point. That wasn't really. I, I do think, though, that his old, after the Philadelphia Convention, in his opposition to the Constitution, his disappointment with the Constitution had evolved had had evolved into pragmatic acceptance. And then, I think, by the time of his retirement, I think wonderment and astonishment. I think he was amazed that the thing had worked so well. And I think that he had come, which is interesting because he was an author of the Constitution, but had really come to revere it. Um, and so a lot of his hyper-nationalism in 1787 was a kind of theoretical hyper-nationalism because we, they, everybody was being speculative. Right? We hadn't done anything like this. There was no analog in the history of the world to a, a continental republic. Um, but I think that by 1830, he is, wow, that was, this has worked really well, I mm -hmm. think. is So that would be one area where he would have changed his mind. 
So as we get to the close here, help us think about how we should think about his career and what he has to offer us. Given the moment we're in, the dangers we face, the strengths we have as a country, what does it mean today to be a Madisonian? Why should we look to Madison? I think that Madison offers us a few things. Um, I think that Madison, above all, is a nationalist. And I don't mean that in the loaded phrase in which it's used today. Even the word nationalism has been co-opted by political divisiveness. Madison was a nationalist in the sense that he believed that the union of the states, right? This is Webster's famous phrase, the union of the states must be preserved. Madison believed that the source of our strength was the national union but also the diversity inherent to the National Union, right? And I think that that is a fundamentally different way of looking at our country than we see today, where people tend to think that there are entire communities in our country that are problems, you know? Um, you know, when, when South Carolina secede, tried to nullify uh, the, the tariff of 1828, Madison, argued that this would be a disaster for Republican government. Um, and, and the specter of secession was a complete disaster. The union of the states had to be preserved. How many people in this country on the left would cheer if Florida seceded from the union today? How many people on the right would cheer if California seceded from the union today? How many people in our country think that the union of the states in all of its diversity is a source of our weakness rather than our strength? I think there's a lot and I think Madison would admonish us for our, frankly, our small mindedness. I think that Madison had a much more continental perspective than many of us do today. I also think that he would remind us about what politics is supposed to be. I mentioned this at the beginning. Politics is not supposed to be our religion. Religion is supposed to be our religion. Politics is a venue to find and discover mutually satisfactory compromises. And the more fact, and a lot of times in our politics today, we want a narrow compromise to like maximize benefits for our little tribe or group. Madison would say, no, you need to find a way to distribute benefits as broadly as possible. Not just because that is what justice entails, but that it is also because that is how the bonds of union are cemented. If people believe that the government will do justice by them, they will be loyal to the government. Right? And that is a completely different vision of politics than what we have today, where hardly anybody expects to have justice done to you by Congress year in and year out. In fact, what tends to motivate more people is the fear that if the other side gets in, then you will have injustice done to you. We have an almost exactly opposite view of what Congress should be doing and what politics should be. Politics should be about drawing in as many people into a coalition as possible because it's there and really only there that you're going to find proposals that truly benefit the country at large and also that are going to cement the bonds of union. And I think that Madison, particularly late in life, is a good reminder of that and also, and it's a reminder not to take the union of the states for granted because in 1819, it sure didn't seem like the union of the states was in any jeopardy, but by 1829, it absolutely did. And we today should not take for granted and assume that the union of the states has been, has been sealed in perpetuity. It's something that has to be cherished and it has to be something that's fought for. And that means taking regard for all all factions within society, not just the ones who are closest to us. I think that's what, what Madison's advice would be for us today. Well, thank you. That's an ideal place to end, and so we'll end there. Uh, Jay Cost, the book is James Madison, America's First Politician. Thanks for being with us, and thank thanks you. to all of you for joining us.